Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Zeling, or uh, say Zawa, more known to my peers as Zawa. I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Uh, is my voice clear enough? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, okay. Welcome to our first webinar by Pan Northern Chapter amidst the COVID pandemic. Our topic for today is uh, fighting fire from the outside and from the inside of the building. Uh, we are also broadcasting the seminar live on our Pam Northern Chapter uh, Facebook page. Feel free to share with your friends. However, there will be no CPD points for those who are viewing through the FB page. To begin, I would like to go over a few items. For all participants, kindly mute your mic to avoid interruption. And if your names are not displayed uh, as registered, kindly rename them. You may do so by clicking the more button when you hover over your name and then click rename. For those who have registered for the CPT points, please be reminded to jot down the sign in code that will be displayed shortly and the sign out code at the end of the seminar. Today, we are pleased to have our speaker, architect Chong Li Xiong, our sponsor, Saint Goban, represented by the country specification manager, Ms. Nita Lau, and our Pam Northern chapter chairman, architect Liao Kuan Chun, with us. Allow me to briefly introduce architect Chong. Uh, architect Chong Li Xiong graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in Architecture as well as Bachelor in Architecture with honors from Deking University. Li Xiong was a council member of the Pertubohan Architect Malaysia and has served in the Practice Projects Committee, the Dis Disciplinary Committee, the Building Standards and Legislation Committee, and Continuous Professional Development Committee. He also served as Honorary Secretary in 2006 to 2007 as Vice President in 2007 to 2008. Architect Chong Li Xiong is active in the pursuit of the study of fire safety engineering from an architectural perspective. Mm -hmm. He is a member of the Institute of Fire Engineers UK and contributed to the drafting of the current uniform building bylaws, the publication of the Guide to Fire Protection in Malaysia and has delivered numerous papers on the application and interpretation of fire safety provisions in architectural designs. He has also shared his expertise as guest lecturer and external examiner to the architectural faculties of UM, USM, UPM, in International Islamic University of Malaysia, Taylor's University, and Ta College. He established his architectural practice, Li Xiong Architect, in 1994, and he has a wide array of projects from apartments to luxury condos, small and large industrial complexes and office buildings. A particular expertise is in the planning and design of clean manufacturing facilities for the food and beverage, electronics, aeronautical and automotive industries. Next, uh, we are pleased to invite our Pam Northern Chapter Chairman Architect Liao Kuan Chung to deliver the opening remarks. Over to you, Chairman. Thank you, uh, Architect Zawa. Um, okay, uh, good morning to all. Can you hear me? Everybody okay? Yeah. Good morning to all and uh, thank you very much for attending the webinar. And I hope everybody's well and safe in these uh, trying times. Uh, Pam Northern Chapter would like to thank uh, Architect Chong Li Xiong for taking his time to share his experience on fire safety matters. Um, I'm going to just sort of like give a bit of a background uh, information and also a bit about our future in terms of fire uh, safety protection. And there is a new UBBL coming out uh, in 2022. Uh, it's under 2021 UBBL. Okay, there are changes uh, to the latest edition, I think in, of 2012. The draft of the UBBL now, I think, is with the Attorney General's chamber and will go through Parliament whenever Parliament sits for uh, adoption in 2022. I think a lot of us know, uh, architects know, that uh, a big part of the UBBL has to do with fire safety matters. 
I think I was told about 60% of actually is uh, on fire matters. Um, so it's very timely uh, that architect uh, John Yixiang is giving us a lecture now. Um, there will be a, a fire safety course as well that will be coming up at the end of this year. The fire safety course is actually uh, being uh, promoted in the background of a uh, complaint from Bomba that 54% of Bomba submissions fail in one way or another. So in that background, PAM, IEM, and Bomba and other stakeholders are actually preparing a course for PSP. Uh, the course, as I said, will be at the end of this year, I think sometime end of this year. It is actually to train the PSP in submission and in actually fire safety matters. Uh, Pam Northern Chapter, I think I uh, through I think Zawa and uh, Miss Ao and myself and I think Bok Kim is actually involved in the drafting of the uh, course, the fire safety course, together with architect uh, Zhang Li Xiong and other members of Pam Professional Practice Committee from KL. We've been working very hard so that the course will be ready and then it will actually be launched. I think not absolutely sure, maybe uh, architect Chong Li Xiong can correct me later on, that the course will be sort of around November or December. Okay, attendee or for these courses, for that course will be given a certificate. Um, I think we were told that the course is around maybe two weekends, but that yet to be confirmed. The idea of giving the certificate actually is that when we apply for the uh, BOMBA submission to BOMBA, the PSP or a submitting person will be given a green lane because you already have attended the course in terms of your application for BOMBA approval. Those who have not attended and this is at the discretion of Bomba, of course. Huh? They will actually treat you a little bit more stricter because uh, once you've attended the course, they know that you have actually know the basic for Bomba submission. Okay, the ultimate aim of this actually eventually, I don't know when, is that the uh, submission will be treated as a some sort of self-certification. In other words, Bomba will not really be responsible for checking your submission. Uh, it will be just like uh, when you're submitting for some of the items in uh, council, they would be just for record only. So ultimately, PSP, or in our case, the architect will be responsible for all the firefighting issues, the passive firefighting issues in your submission. So I think I urge, we'll keep it in view, we'll inform all the members when the course comes up Okay, uh, I that, with that in mind, I think uh, I'd like to wish everybody a very fruitful webinar. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Before we pass on to Ms. Nita Lau, our sponsor, uh, should you have any questions throughout the presentation, please type them in the chat box and we will try to answer them at the end of the presentation. Now let us welcome Ms. Nita Lau to deliver her presentation. Over to you, Ms. Nita. Thank you, Architect Zawa, for the introduction. Good morning to all professionals. Honorable Chairman, Architect Casey Lel, Deputy Chairman, Architect Ahmad Tajuddin bin Haji Muhammad Ali, Vice Chairman, Architect Zalena Abdul Aziz, and all Committee Persatuan Architect Malaysia Northern Chapter. My name is Nita Lau. I am the Country Specifications Manager for Saint Goban, Malaysia. Together with me today is Mr. Joshua Goy, Assistant Area Sales Manager for Northern Region. The both of us are handling three business units under St. Goban, Malaysia, which you can see in our name card, Jipbox, Weber, and Emix. I am delighted and honored to be here participating in this event today. We are here truly as one united nation we do our best when we do it together. 
making the world a better home. Our purpose, set the course of our common future. Together and with our customers, we design, manufacture, distribute solutions, providing quality performance while caring for the planet. Our purpose reflects who we are, our 350 years of history, our collective strength and leadership, empowering us to pursue development in an inclusive way, addressing challenges, humility, climate change, resources protection, and fight against inequality. Our purpose, a call to action. Our approach is clear and focused on the future. Together with our customers, stakeholders, partners, unleash individual and collective aspiration. Our purpose, based on value that give us, that guide us, we carry out our business in compliance with the principles of conduct and actions that permit our corporate culture. This is the profound ambitions of our purpose to act every day, to make the world a better and beautiful, sustainable place to live. Our mission, Tinkoban design, manufacture, distribute materials and solutions for the construction, mobility, healthcare, and different industrial applications. We develop through a continued innovative process. We provide well-being, performance, and safety while addressing the challenges of sustainability construction. We resource efficiency and fight against climate change. The 356 years of history, Tengoban was incorporated in 1665 we were the manufacturer for glaze and mirror. In 1688, Tengoban ventured into glass table casting. In 1850, Tengoban expanded our business to the Europe market and we diversified on new products. In 1990, <clears throat> we focused on high technology content for building distributions. In the year 2000, Tengoban focused on strategy of habitat and we celebrated our 350 years. We are a strong global group, which organize and consolidate with among four regions. We are one of the most, 100 most top innovative group in the world for the past nine years. We are committed to carbon neutrality and we are the world leadership in most of our business unit. We have 167,000 employees worldwide we have, uh, we have 1,000 manufacturing plants, which presents in 70 countries. Single brand segregates our main activities into two pillars. We have our innovative materials and solutions to adapt to the local market by distributing materials such as glass, gypsum plasterboard, insulation materials, construction, uh, construction chemical, and et cetera. The other main activities pillar will be our value added solutions, which automotive glass and abrasive. This is Singoban Group Malaysia. As you can see, we have eight business units uh, in Malaysia. I will elaborate each and every business unit. Singoban Jibrock Gypsum Plasterboard. Jibrock business offer a comprehensive range of value added plasterboard. We provide innovative accessibility optimum material performance that comply to your desired criterion of your home space and design. Besides that, we also provide a complete range of uh, interior building, metal components, accessories jointing for your ceiling and drywall finishes. Sengoban emphasize on multi-comfort, which you feel, you hear, you see, and you breathe. Jibrock has a wide range of gypsum plasterboard, ranging from 9mm to 25mm for different performance. As you can see, we have acoustics performance, fire rated performance, moisture resistant performance, high impact performance, of course, aesthetic performance, and indoor air quality. Besides that, Jibrock also have calcium silicate board, Dura Flex Fire Stop, 
range from 8 to 12 mm for fire protection purpose. Sengoban Weber Emix. The next business will be Sengoban Weber and Emix. We have a complete range of solutions developed using advanced formula technology to meet the highest technology, technical requirements. We offer premixed products such as pasta and water, including, including skin coat, plastering, screening, menstrual mortar. We also have towel fixing such as towel adhesive and towel graft. Weber also have construction chemicals such as waterproofing, epoxy, non-string graft, and etc. As you can see, we have the solutions for roofing to the swimming pool, interior and exterior wall, flooring, and also wet area solutions. The next business unit will be St. Goban Explorer Glass. Sorry. We are the one of the world leading glass manufacturing facility for all segments, from part of innovative material for energy efficiency glazing, thermal comfort, acoustic comfort, visual comfort, and human safety. Another business unit under single band will be Isover Climavec. It's a pre insulation insulated duct for air conditioning made of glass wool. It's a high dense rigid glass wool board, excellent fire performance, uh, all in one system without any metals, easy for assemble, obtaining the roofing, folding, and also stapling and tapping. It's a pre acoustical insulated uh, ducting, which has acoustic performance, and the benefit of it is a great acoustic performance and energy saving without the needs of silencer. Next business unit, we have single band at force fiberglass technology. It's a solution for new building construction and renovations for protect and repair decorative walls and etc. At force glass fiber tape is a cell adhesive tape to reinforce drywall joint between plasterboard to make the wall uh, smooth and finish smooth and finish. Fiberglass. Uh, glass fiber mesh, glass fiber mesh for flooring reinforcement, excellent for uh, alternative to light metal mesh to disperse the fibers and ensure low elongation and high mechanical strength. Besides that, at force also have a wide range of paintable and ready to use glass mat wall covering. Like I mentioned earlier, single man has two different, two uh, main activities pillar. One is innovative materials, and another one will be the provide value added service. Saint Goban Securit Automotive Glass, which will provide a uh, full range of glaze, uh, glass for complete automotive cars, windscreen, and windows, which we provide to Pro Duo, Isuzu, and Proton. Last business unit available in Saint Goban will be Saint Goban Norton Abrasive. Norton offers a complete range of portfolio and cutting, grinding, cutting, grinding, blending, finishing, and polishing solutions. It's a material which uh, highly high range across the market, inclusive of engineering, industrial, automotive, and marines. Saint Goban offer from exterior to finishing. Exterior facades, we have our glass, technology high performance glass to the insulation material, clean mauve, to the interior finish, gyp rock gypsum plasterboard for drywall and ceiling applications, at force for wall covering, and last but not least, we have Weber and Emix premix industrial mortar. St. Goban create a living space and improve daily life by combining comfort and stability to ensure and enhance the well-being of people everywhere. That's all for my slides. Uh, thank you. I wish to extend uh, my graduate thank you to Pam Northern Chapter. Thank you, Nita. Uh, there are not, I think there's no questions here, but maybe I can do one quick one uh, as well on the fire safety topic today. Uh, the last check with uh, Joshua, we were looking at the shaft liner system, but I was uh, told that uh, that 
you have approval overseas but not in Malaysia. How about now? Have you obtained any approval for Malaysia use? Okay, uh, for shaft liner system, um, unfortunately for leaf shaft area, it's not allowed. Uh, but uh, for the M&E riser, smaller shaft areas is allowed. And we do have the system for it. All right, thanks, Nita. Thank you. So any, uh, if you guys have any uh, inquiries, do look for me or either our region, uh, regional, which is uh, Joshua. He is based in Northern. Thank you, Nika. Thank you. Before we proceed to our main talk today, a friendly reminder, please type your questions in the chat box and we will try to answer them during the Q&A session. Without further ado, I would like to welcome Architect Chong to deliver his talk. Uh, all right, uh, Architect Chong, the floor is yours. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you, Architect Zawa. Thank you, Architect Casey Liao. And thank you, Singoban, for making this, uh, this event here possible today. Um, it's really a great privilege for me to be in Penang today, virtually, of course, uh, to be addressing this seminar. Uh, I really miss Penang. Um, I miss the sunshine over there, I miss the cha kui tiao, and I definitely miss the ji chong fun over there. I really, really look forward to an opportunity to go back to Penang again, once I'm allowed to do so. But uh, I think um, this opportunity to be addressing all of you here today um, is already halfway there. So, so that's very, very good. Really appreciate it. Right, of course, the topic today is designing for fire, firefighting access and, uh, and rescue. Um, designing for firefighting from the outside, that's the first part of this uh, CPD here and um, at a later part, on, after the halfway mark, we'll be going into part two, which is designing for firefighting from the inside. Now, um, a lot of us are very, very concerned about the, uh, the prescriptions in the uniform building bylaws. Uh, architect Casey Liao gave us a little bit of uh, update a little bit of um, 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 secret information that uh, there will be possibly a very new UBBL coming up. Well, just to give you guys a heads up, it is not a revamping of the entire UBBL as we know it today. It is, as usual, merely an update and uh, a rationalization on a lot of the prescriptions. Yeah, um, don't fret about it because Really, uh, in our kind of a work, in terms of the applications of um, uh, the principles of designing for fire safety, uh, it is all knowledge based and it is really, really all performance based. That is the most important part. Uh, the UBBL is merely a set of laws to help us to define the minimum prescriptions that is deemed to comply so that all of us, when we do our designs, we don't have to go back to the drawing board again to try and reinvent the wheel, so to speak. You know, when you'll be designing a car, uh, you know you'll have four wheels at the four corners, so you don't really have to redesign the wheel. You know the wheels are already round, and uh, you can immediately take off the shelf and apply it to your design, uh, apply the correct elements for the correct application to achieve the correct purpose. Right, so the UBBL is merely a set of law, so don't be, uh, don't be afraid of it. I take it as um, if, you, if you look at, say, our driving license, all of us, for us to be able to drive a car, we have to go through the process of getting our driving license. And, uh, and once we are on the road, we are subjected to all the laws of the road. Uh, you'll have speed limits, you'll have... Uh, when do you have to use your indicators to turn? You have to stop at the stop sign. Um, when the traffic light is green, you go. When the traffic light is red, you have to stop. When the traffic light is amber, you go even faster to beat the red light, you know, that kind of a thing. So laws will just be there for us to define the parameters, the minimum parameters for us to work with. The real intention, of course, in the practice of our well, in 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 the uh, in the practice of our profession, 
is that we are to continuously improve. We are continuous, continuously supposed to research, to analyze, and to always improve our building designs. And improving a building design, um, as an architect, of course, we say, yeah, we're improving the building aesthetics. We are improving the built environment. And a key component to the improvement of the built environment lies with safety and fire safety is definitely one of the paramount um, elements that we should be considering. Uh, so therefore, uh, the, um, the approach to the CPD today is not so much about talking about how to implement the bylaws, but rather I will want to run through the process of the principles of designing for fire safety in this particular uh, in today in particular we are talking about we will be exploring uh, the principles of designing for fire fighting from the outside and the principles of fighting fire from the inside and we will be making references to some of the uh, prescriptions in the uniform building bylaws and okay let, let's let's take it from there okay now if you have any questions along the way uh, feel free to put it into the chat box so that uh, our moderator architect Zawa will be able to look at it and uh, we would uh, we would attempt to answer the queries at the end of the seminar all, all right so let's get down to it now, designing for fire safety uh, from the outside of course in the uniform building bylaws the main prescription that we rely on is that of fire appliance access uh, this is uh, of course bylaw 140 um, in the UBBL 19084, it was a very, very basic prescription of a fire appliance access, perimeter access around the building. And in uh, the revision in 2012, okay, we've added further things into the bylaws, um, becoming a little bit more detailed. Huh? So in the clause 140 on fire appliance access, we talk about the access way. There is an access way clause over here. Okay, access way, and that's a primary one. Uh, access way shall be provided within the site, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and you have to provide it in uh, in reference to the percentage of the perimeter uh, length of the building. All right. So therefore, we have uh, the uh, access way. Then down below, um, just one single clause. Just one single clause over here under D, 140D, it says the access way shall be laid on the level platform or if on an incline, a grader not exceeding 1 to 15. Um, and then the term access road appears. And access road shall be laid on an incline not exceeding a gradient of 1 to 8.3. Okay, so now we notice that there's a recognition now of two different elements that makes up a fire appliance access. There is this element known as the access road and the element known as the access way. And sandwiched in between both of these is an element known as access opening. All right, now we will get down to the uh, item on access opening on the second part of the CPD today. So moving on, now means of access for fighting. Okay, the other element of uh, fighting fire uh, for means of access for fighting fire is this one, clause 197A. Means of access for fire fighting in buildings over 80 meters high and so on and so on and so forth. Now, this is related to height, all right? The access way is related to the volume of the building. And then over here, you see means of access for fire fighting in buildings over 18 meters high. And the prescriptions over here is that you would realize that the prescriptions here are about elements that are inside the building, installations are inside the building. We're talking about firefighting access lobbies, firefighting shafts, firefighting lifts, firefighting staircases, dry and wet rising systems, right? So these are internal applications or internal installations in a building for, fire, for fighting fire. And it's related to the height of a building. Right, so perimeter access on the outside is related to the volume of the building, whereas the installations on the inside is related to the height of the building. Right? Uh, these are all bylaw prescriptions. So it's building height over here. All right, let's look at the fire appliance access. Now we're talking about um, uh, firefighting from the outside. 
Now the access way by inference from the descriptions in from the prescriptions in the bylaw, it is inferred that the access way refers to an area for the entry, maneuvering and parking of a fire appliance of fire appliances during firefighting and rescue operations. Right, whereas an, an access road is a road capable of accommodating the passage of fire appliances to enter an access way. Right, and access openings are doorways or openings that allow the fast and safe entry of firefighting and rescue personnel into a building during firefighting and rescue operations. Huh? Uh, again, there are a lot of uh, um, perhaps misconceptions about uh, what constitutes an access way and what constitutes an access road. Perhaps the best analogy I can give you is that is this. If you imagine a car parking garage, we, we have all designed car parking structures, be it basement or above ground and all that. All right, what are the components of car parking or, or rather what is the basic accommodation of, uh, of a car parking garage or a car parking structure? Right, the basic accommodation, of course, we have to accommodate cars or vehicles to park in the different bays. In a car parking floor, uh, what do we have on a car parking floor? Uh, we have the individual bays marked out for the parking of the cars or the vehicles. Right? Then to get access to the, to the individual bays, there will be the driveways uh, for the cars to drive along all the park to go past all the parking bays to look for which empty, uh, which uh, parking bay is empty. And when you find one, you use the same driveway for you to maneuver yourself into the parking bay. Right now, that whole parking floor, parking bays and the driveways in that floor would be the equivalent of an access way in firefighting terms. Right, so it is the access way is essentially the platform or the surface area for the driving in of a fire appliance access and for the fire access for, for, for the firemen to decide where is a good position for them to park the fire appliance, the fire engine, right, when you arrive at your place, right. Now, the access road in this case is the, uh, the analogy of the car parking again the access road would then be the equivalent of the car parking ramps that brings the cars to the car parking floor right that is the way we have to look at it right the access way is really the area for the maneuvering well Firstly, for the access, the fire engine will have to be able to get onto the uh, to the to the access way. Then, within the access way, the fire engine must be able to maneuver to drive to its location and to be able to park for the purposes of it fighting the fire, uh, which I will describe later. And the access road is the equivalent of the car parking ramps in the multi-story car parking for you, for the fire engines to be able to get to the respective access way. Okay, that, that's the best analogy I can think of. Uh, but with that in mind, okay, then we will have a clearer understanding. All right, so the external access, uh, what would qualify an external access way? Uh, what are the components uh, or ingredients that would qualify an external platform that you've designed to be used as an access way all right now so access for emergency rest and rescue vehicles equipment and personnel um, of course you'll be relying on roads pavements parking very very important in the context of fire safety is the availability of water hydrants storage tanks or uh, in an outdoor environment, in a theme park environment and all that, uh, you may want to identify where's the source of your water. If you don't have access to mains water via hydrants, you will have to find an excess of water, a, body, a big, huge body of water, right? Like lakes, rivers or ponds, 
detention ponds or whatever that's suitable. And of course, the access of the firefighting systems in the premise, okay, that relates to the access way. When the firemen arrive at the premises itself, uh, there have to be a clarity of the type and building and its function, configuration of the building, uh, location of fire control panels, where installed, location of breaching inlets and the pump rooms, and then therefore access into the building from the access way, uh, protected passages, protected stairs, firemen's lift, firefighting lobbies, and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, we are going to more of the details there. Now, in terms of the mechanical installations, all, right, now all of these installations, uh, these are the ones that are specified in the 10th schedule relative to the building purpose group, the height of the building, the floor area of the building, and the volume of the building, and the configuration of the buildings, right? You then relate it, uh, you then look for the prescriptions in the 10th schedule, and the 10th schedules will then give you prescriptions. And most of these prescriptions, I've, in, in, uh, I've included it over here. Of course, uh, the requirement of hydrants is not in the 10th schedule, right? The requirements of hydrants is in the body of the bylaw, it says that all buildings must have access to a hydrant or a source of mains water, as I've just described just now, okay? But however, the 10th schedule does specify pressurized hydrants, right? For, for certain building types and certain building volumes, uh, the 10th schedule will specifically specify that it has to be equipped with pressurized hydrant. So therefore, a pressurized hydrant system will consist of, of course the hydrants itself on the roads and it will have the main it will have a water tank storage and of course you're keeping the entire system you'll need the pumps to obviously pump the water and to ensure that the system is pressurized and there will be a breaching inlet for the external coupling to to connect an external source of water to replenish the water tanks in a sprinkler system where specified, uh, of course, we will have the sprinklers themselves within the building. And you'll notice that there are a lot of common components here. Okay, we'll need the water tanks, uh, the, the storage tanks for the sprinkler systems. You'll need the pumps to pressurize the sprinkler systems. And you would need the breaching inlet for the purposes of connecting to, to an external water source to replenish the tanks. A dry riser system where specified for buildings above 80 meters. Uh, you have the, uh, the landing valves in each of the floors uh, uh, together with the, uh, with the canvas holes in the cabinet. And a dry rising system, as the name implies, is dry. So there's no inherent water built into the system. But however, you will need a breaching inlet for you to connect it to an external source of water. And the wet rising system, the diagram would be exactly the same as the dry rising system, except that now, before the breaching inlets, you will have the storage tanks, you will have the pumps, and then of course you have the breaching inlet. Yeah? So these are the commonality of water systems uh, that's going to be prescribed in the 10th schedule. And the understanding of this will then help us an awful lot in our, in, in, in our design. The basic principle of most of you will have seen this uh, this diagram for many many years already but uh, okay just to recap what we are talking about um, a cross-sectional area of a building that is installed with the internal uh, firefighting systems that will be the access way uh, of course we have the external source of water over here the access way the breaching inlet of course, then the water tanks, the pumps, and this will then represent all of the internal systems, uh, be it the uh, the high, uh, sorry, be it the uh, the sprinklers and the risers. Huh? Okay, of course the diagram not exactly like this, but um, configuratively, this is uh, this is what what it would be. Um, the hose reel system would also be the same like this, except that the hose reel systems will not have the breaching inlet. Right, that will be the only difference. You see, the hose reel is really not meant for firefighters to use. They won't bother with the hose reel. Hose reel is for you and me to use as the first aid. So 
uh, once you specify the capacity of the tank for the whole reels, um, that's probably about it. Huh? You don't need to connect the uh, the whole reel system to the breaching inlet, all right? But otherwise, the breaching inlet will connect the sprinklers and the risers. All right, so when the uh, fire and uh, okay, if there's a fire, when a fire occurs, if the building is already equipped with its own internal systems, um, the uh, the systems will then activate. If uh, you've got sprinklers, the sprinklers will activate. Right? And when the fire engine arrives, the the concept is always that when the fire engine arrives, okay, good, they will start coming in. Uh, there will be lots of water in the fire engine, and the fireman engine will immediately get a hose and start shooting at the fire. Yeah, that's probably what they would do <laughs> um, if if they can actually see the fire from the outside, right? If they if they know oh the fire is leaping off the window, okay, that's probably what's the first thing they'll do. Actually, the first thing they do is to stage the fire engines first. They make the full analysis of the situation, and then they'll have to plan the strategy, the firefighting strategy with relation to the fire. So the first thing they do is actually to take stock of the situation. But yes, uh, if they find that they would need to uh, start to fight the fire from the outside uh, to cool the surfaces and all that, yeah, whatever water that's available in the fire engine, they will start to activate that. Yeah? But the whole purpose, the real intention of the fire appliance when it arrives at the site is that uh, the fire engine is really a big giant water pump. So the building is equipped with the internal systems the real work that the firemen will need to do is to look for the external water source. They will connect the ex external water source via the hydrants into the fire engine, which is, again, like I said, it is a giant water pump. And the fire engine will then use the water for the purposes of fighting the fire from the outside to, to the outside, right? Or more importantly, if the building is so equipped with the internal systems, it is for the fire engine to connect the external source of water and to be able to pump it through the breaching inlet to replenish the water tanks for the internal systems. And this is very, very important, excruciatingly important for sprinklers, for example, because once a fire is on the in, starting on the inside, the sprinklers will be activated and you will really, really be relying on the sprinkler systems to dampen, if not to put out the fire. Right? And then when the firemen arrives on the inside, if the building are equipped with the risers, the firemen will need water in the risers because the risers are effectively internal fire hydrants for the building. Right? So if it's a dry riser, they would really, really immediately need to connect to the breaching inlet because the water to the dry riser will only be coming from the external source via the fire engine into the breaching inlet. Uh, if it's a wet riser, the fireman will have the capacity for the intern from the internal storage first. And as they use it, they will need to breach it in to ensure continuous supply to the risers. In terms of the diagram, all right, this is, will be an illustration of the uh, relationship between the access way and uh, the, the systems that we're talking about. Huh? Right, just back to the access way. Uh, we are talking about the volumes of the access uh, of, of the building, right? Uh, building volume, and then from there, from the bylaws, we deduce uh, what is the minimum percentage of the perimeter of the building that will be access to the um, to the fire appliance access way. So therefore, this yellow line would be the measurement of the length of the access way relative to the perimeter of the building. That would be the measurement of this yellow line over here. Uh, not that we have a physical yellow line, but uh, okay, in the diagram, that's what we're actually looking for. We're looking for the interface, the interface of the, the edge of the access way relative to the perimeter of the building. In this example, if the minimum required um, length of the access way is say that this length of this part of the building facade. So therefore, this will be the minimum required length of this access way. And then we'll have the access road. Now remember, if we regard this as a car parking floor, then that would be the equivalent of the ramp to get you up to the car parking floor. Okay, And that would be known as the access road. 
Then we have the excess openings. The excess openings are um, prescribed to be that the excess way must have a tangential uh, a, a, a tangential facing to the excess openings so that the uh, the firemen when they're on the access way they'll be able to see directly and their uh, their particular references as to how far away would the access way be yeah which i'll describe a bit later and then there will be this age of the access way or the definition of what is known as age of the access way and the age of the access way shall be a minimum of two meters from the face of the building and a maximum of 10 meters from the face of the building. Now, the age of the access way need not necessarily be a physical barrier. Right? This is really uh, uh, for the purposes of the mode of measurement. So, for example, if we know the minimum width of an access way is six meters, all right? Okay, so that is the actual width of the access way that uh, you're going to provide. The measurement of the six meter width of the access way shall not be measured closer than two meters from the face of the building, and it cannot be measured more than 10 meters away from the face of the building. Right? That is the intention. Right? So it need not be a physical curb. It need not be a physical barrier. Right? But of course, you, if you do a physical curb over here, that is much appreciated because it's a it's a very very clear and visual demarcation between where the access way is and where essentially is the edge is. And most times we use the aprons of the building as the edge, you know, or the walkway and things like that. Now, in the situation where the building will require more than say this particular surface to front an access way and you are able to then of course it is perfectly okay to demarcate another part of the building to make up the required access uh, the required perimeter access then the the, peri the required perimeter access need not be continuous around the building it need not be continuous you need half it doesn't necessarily mean that access way must be here and then it continues to this side of the building no you can actually have it on any other face the intention is that you meet the minimum requirements of the length of the access way facing the buildings. Okay, uh, so to connect these two access way, then you'll be looking at the incorporation of another access road, right? So it is like having car parking on uh, two different levels. So you have access way on two different levels. Now you need to. You need the cars to be able to connect from one level to another, right? You you uh, you don't expect someone to go up looking for a car parking on the first floor, and then they find that, oh, first floor is full. I need to get to the second floor. They drive out of the building and then come back again into the second floor, right? No, definitely not. So you would want to connect the two parking floors together. And same concept with an access way. If you have got the access way here, and you've got the access way there on a different level, Yep, you would want to connect it via an access road. Yeah, and again, the access road will be defined as to what are the prescriptions. Okay, a closer look at the elements that we're talking about just now. Okay, again, we have got the access way defined over here. And internal firefighting access, you'll have the firefighting shafts, which consists of the firefighting access lobby, fireman's lift firefighting staircase, and very importantly, the key backbone of a firefighting shaft, uh, the risers, or we call it the fire mains. And uh, to serve all of these items, we will need the fire pumps. Uh, we will need the emergency, gener uh, emergency generators. And again, very importantly, uh, you will need the breaching inlets. Huh? So these are the components that would require uh, kind of ready access for the firemen. Uh, for example, the fire pump rooms, of course, ideally, you should just put it in the front of the building, like what is shown over here. Like, the firemen will love you for it. Bomba will love us for that, but we are not going to like it. We are architects, you see. We don't put things in. We don't put a fire tank in the front entrance. But the key element here is that there has to be an easy access for the firemen to be able to reach the pump rooms. Yeah? And uh, it is uh, regulated that uh, the location of your fire pumps should not be 
lower, ideally it should be at the ground level. Under no situation, it should be on the level above the fire appliance access level. And if you have to go below the level of the fire appliance access level, you may go down at most one level. Uh, that means one level below the fire appliance access level. Okay, so ideal position, which is not ideal for architects, is the ground level, fire appliance access level, straight in. What is best for us and acceptable by Bomba would be the pump rooms is one level below. That means one level base, basement, uh, lower ground. Uh, okay, and under no circumstances would the pumps be on the level above. And the relationship is that they have to be a hydrant. The nearest hydrant to the breaching inlet shall be located not more than 30 meters away from the breaching inlet. And of course, hydrant to hydrant will be 90 meters. Huh? So the, um, uh, they must be a hydrant within 30 meters of the breaching inlet. And that would then be the access opening that we're talking about in the Malaysian context. Access opening for the firemen to be able to enter the building into a safe shaft for them to fight the fire from the inside. All right, let's look at the application of uh, the, uh, this, this, uh, this UBBL clause on the uh, using the volume of the building uh, for us to make the provision on the minimum fire appliance access way around the building. Okay, okay. this is the only provision that we have in the bylaws with regards to um, where, you, where you're supposed to provide a fire appliance access way. Uh, it goes by volume. Okay, we're all very, very familiar with this. We've done it to death. <laughs> we do it for every single one of our projects, generally by the volumes. Uh, starting from 7,000 cubic meters, you start off with one sixth of the perimeter of the building requiring a fire appliance access way. Now, remember again, uh, I want to emphasize all these are minimum, all right? There's nothing to stop you from providing more, please. <laughs> There's absolutely nothing for you to stop you from providing more. This is absolute minimum. And uh, all the way up to an island site, 112,000 cubic meters, and it becomes an island site. So we're all very familiar with that. Okay, now let's look at the application uh, by building volume. Using a cube of a building, 30 meters by 30 meters, and 30 meters high. So this building has got a nominal volume of 27,000 cubic meters which will then, according to the bylaws, uh, we would require one sixth of the perimeter of the building to be fronting and access way, okay? So this will be then be the one sixth of the building fronting the access way, right? So this one complies in that sense. Now, what if we double the volume over here? Uh, we just add one more floor. So what's the volume on this building now? Same floor plate, 30 meters by 30 meters, but now it's doubled in volume by doubling the height. So now it's 60 meters high. We will require one quarter of the perimeter to be fronted by an excess way. So one quarter of the perimeter fronting the excess way, in this case, yep, we just add a little bit of a length to that. Huh? This is a cube building. so. Yep, just adding a little bit of a length there, we have increased from one sixth of the frontage to one quarter of the frontage, okay? That's how we do it. Um, what if we add in another volume to the building? So what have we got now? We've got 30 meters by 30 meters. Now the building is three times the height of that original building. And according to the bylaws, we need half of the perimeter to be fronting an access way. Mm, okay, I think it's kind of easy, right? That's what we do. So now you've got half of the half of the uh, the perimeter of the building fronting an access way. Let's go higher. Okay, what have we got now? 30 meters by 30 meters by 120 meters high. Now we're talking about kind of serious high rise already. 
And according to the bylaws, for this volume, we need three quarters of the perimeter to be fronting an excess phase. So how do we do it? I think it's very simple. That's three quarters for you. Right? And so on and so forth. And if we go for an island site, then we've got that. Okay. Now, if you look at the principle of this, they all, sh all these buildings share exactly the same floor plate in terms of a perimeter floor plate. Yeah? Um, but the requirements of the, um, the, the length of the, uh, the excess way goes by the volume. So the, the increase in volume in, in, in this example here is by the increase in the height of the building, not by the increase on the floor plate of the building. Okay, And this would be our immediate response to the prescriptive uh, requirements of the perimeter access. And so in a small building, if a fire starts over there, um, this example here is a 30 meter high building. So it would have already got a set of wet risers inside the building, firemen's access lift and all that. So if, when the fireman comes, when they arrive over here, if the fire is actually leaping out of the window over there, you know, they actually will not be able to get to that side of the building to fight the fire from the outside, right? If the fire is seen from the outside, it's leaping up from there, they will not be able to get there, right? Because you did not give them an access way. The access, the prescribed access way is only one six, and you've complied with it fully. You've only given this. So what can a fireman do? The best a fireman can do is from this access way, you're supposed to have an access opening, right? And the access opening leads you into the firefighting shaft on the inside. So they can only fight the fire from the inside in this situation. Huh? If the same fire occurs in this high rise building in exactly the same location. So now you've got a full perimeter access, right? So you think that, oh, good. So now the fireman can fight the fire from the outside if the fire is leaping out from the window. So they come with a fire appliance here and they park the fire appliance here. Where in the world is a fire? The fire is up in the air 150 meters above the ground. There's nothing the fireman can do to be able to reach the fire from the outside. So what the firemen have to do, they will still rely on the access opening to enter into the building, use the firefighting shaft to go up the building, and then you know, they, uh, they Right? They still be able to. They, they still have to do that. You know? they go go up the building and then they uh, they. Sorry, uh, I uh, I really should get rid of this. Uh... That's better. <laughs> Sorry, guys. All right. So the um. So, so see, this is the uh, this is the 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 application. You know? I'm not saying that the bylaw works. In fact, if you comply with the minimum prescriptions of the bylaw, all of these examples here comply fully with the minimum prescriptions of the bylaw. But you see the deficiencies, right? In none of this situation, the fire, the printer fire appliance access actually works in that situation. Okay? I'm not saying don't do it, please. By all means, we have to do we have to provide fire appliance access ways. Yeah? But it is an understanding of things like this that will allow us to then design it a bit better. All right, uh, let me introduce you to, uh, oh, I think all of these are blocking the screen, right? Okay, now let me introduce you to another, uh, illustration same building volume this building volume is 30 meters by 30 meters by 30 meters high so it's one six so it's the same example as we had before and this is the one six perimeter excess that uh, that 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 we allowed for okay now if this building happens to be a low-rise building 30 meters by 90 meters by 10 meters high it's got the same building volume and we require one six of the perimeter. So this would then be the equivalent of the one six of the perimeter to serve this building, right? That will be a one six serving that volume of the building. And this will be the one six serving a building with a bigger perimeter. 
Next example, we go up to one quarter, 60 meters high. So that would be the one quarter. Now here, if we do a building like this, this building will then have the same volume as that building. So you'll need one quarter of the fire or of the building to be served by fire appliance access. So, okay, that is the one quarter. So this one quarter fulfills the minimum requirements of the UBBL of a building of 54,000 cubic meters. Done. Now what happens if the fire starts? Oops. Okay. So what happens when a fire starts this way? Right, if a fire starts there, uh, how is the firefighting, how are the firemen going to get there? Well, in this case, they'll probably have to enter the building. But remember, uh, this building is low rise, so it has got no internal rises. Right? If it's sprinkled, very good. At least the sprinklers will help. Right? But really, the firemen can't reach that corner for them to fight the fire from the outside. They have to enter the building, and when they enter the building, they do not have a riser in this building is unlikely. 10 meters, unlikely anyone would give them a riser inside the building. So they have to drag the hoses from the hydrants on the outside to enter the building somehow to reach that corner. Now, if you have this building here of this nature, you're giving them this one quarter perimeter access and the fire starts over there. It is way, 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 way too far. It is way, way, way too far. So just minimum prescriptive compliance does not necessarily mean performance compliance. Look at this diagram over here. You can see that uh, uh, this is just a picture you know, of a fire somewhere in London, very narrow streets and all that. Now, if we draw in the prescriptions that we have, our minimum prescriptions, we got the minimum two meter edge. Right, we have the minimum two meter edge. That is probably the scale of a minimum two meter edge. And we got the minimum six meters fire appliance access way. That is the minimum fire appliance access way. See, in reality, this is what happens, or this is what a situation would be like uh, in the in the uh, in the event of a fire. So are we still designing to minimum prescriptions? I really hope not. Right? I really hope not. If you look at the, the way in which the firemen deploy their uh, the sky ladders and all that, a basic principle for a low building, if they're trying to reach the top over there, they will be parking the, uh, the, the appliance quite a distance away. Why? Because they have to achieve that angle. Right, for purposes of stability, to be able to reach that fire at that corner. But if the building is a taller building, they actually, ironically, they have to get closer to the building because of the reach of the boom. You know, when they extend the boom to its maximum, for them to get to a much higher, to maximum height, they do have to be actually closer to the building. So it's kind of ironic, you know, um, that uh, that these are the basic principles of a geometry that we cannot uh, we, we, we cannot deny um, and the firemen really they want they would want the uh, fire appliances to be as far away from the radiant heat of the fire as possible they really don't want to be forced to only drive on the driveway which is just immediately adjacent to a fire that's burning out of the building right? they really really want to be very very far away as possible to be able to get access to the uh, hydrants, to be able to connect all the hoses to the fire engine, and for the fire engine to be able to connect the hoses back into the breaching inlets or for the immediate firefighting purposes. Now, I would uh, share with you uh, uh, a little bit of... Uh, does anyone know, is there a way to get rid of this bar? Okay, never mind. 
I, I'll share with you a bit on the fire, uh, the Singapore Fire Code uh, from the S Singapore Civil Defence um, uh, Act on fire on uh, on 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 the on the fire codes. Uh. All right, Singapore, I got very similar um, fire codes or so UBBL, but when it comes to a fire appliance access, they do have this recognition that uh, just going by building volume alone may not necessarily uh, fulfill all the necessary requirements for fire safety. Um, so in Singapore, for buildings under purpose group of other residential, office, uh, shops, and places of assembly, right? they do have this prescription where they use the floor plate of the building. The, the, the plinth area or the biggest floor plate of the building as uh, additional prescription to define how much of a perimeter access you require. Right, so proportion of perimeter access determined by floor plate area uh, instead of volume of building. Right, let's take an example over here. Huh? Uh, this example where a floor plate is 4,000 uh, if you've got a floor plate between 4,000 square meters to 8,000 square meters, you will require half of the perimeter of the building uh, to be fronting and access way. All right, okay, now let's look at this example here, the example that we had earlier. Uh, in this example, in this building of this size of this volume and this configuration, if you're using the volume, which is either, which is UBBL, uh, by volume, 54,000 cubic meters, you require one quarter of the perimeter to have an access rate. So it's defined like this one. Right? And we already see how this configuration may not necessarily uh, work for bomba or for our own purpose of, in terms of fire safety because there's just way too far over here. Right? But if you define it using the Singapore code by using a floor plate area, 30 meters by 180 meters by floor plate area, uh, 5,400 square meters. You will only, uh, you would require half of the perimeter to be accessible, to be fronting a fire appliance access way. Right? So if the fire starts over there, and if you have designed using the principle of floor plate area to determine the minimum access way length of your building, this is what you will get, because this is half. Okay, so this is the way to analyze our own design and to, uh, to uh, oh dear, let me just move that again. <laughs> this is the way to analyze our own design. Okay, so applying a performance criterion to check on the prescriptive codes can often lead to a better design understanding. Yeah? Once we understand the principles of what we are designing for, then I think really, really the onus is on us as the architects to appreciate and to understand all these principles. And then for us to design the buildings, yeah? and not just to design it to the minimum compliance of the uh, UBBL only. Because just compliance with UBBL does not in any way give you a guarantee that um, your, 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 your design will work from a fire safety point of view. There's some illustrations on um, how fires look like. A terrace house situation, the fire starting from the inside. In Malaysia, of course, we, uh, we, we prescribe our party walls very, very, um, very, very, rigidly in terms of the construction of a party wall. Uh, but I see this is where the failures are. Uh, this neighbor is already on fire because the fire has spread to the underside of the roofing somehow. It's leaped across to the neighbor from this illegal extension over here. Right? There's, see, there's no party wall separating this illegal extension from the neighbor. The original one had a party wall there, see, right at the top. But this extension here has got no party wall. It's got the eave overhanging into the neighbor side. And that's exactly where the fire is spreading. It's spreading below the eave. And this neighbor is going to be burned pretty soon. And this one has already suffered the full brunt of the fire uh, that spread into it. 
this is the severity of a big fire from the inside when the internal compartments are fully blown up the fire is really really at its maximum the best the fireman can do is to cool the fire from the outside to try and contain it and to prevent the building from collapsing look at the kind of distances around here you don't even see the fire engine in this picture why because the fire engine is way 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 behind uh, and uh, when the firemen are ho holding the hose and all these hose are connected to the fire engine out of this picture because there's just so much debris that's going to be falling down and the radiant heat is so intense if you have a fire engine parked over there the fire engine may be the one that's going to catch fire an external an external fire right this is an apartment building apartment buildings are always compartmented so the fire is hopefully being able to be contained within only the apartment on fire i'm sure the firemen have already gone into the building in this situation to uh, to contain the uh, the spread of fire from accessing the corridors etc so they would have done the containment measures on the inside on the outside what they need to do is to try and reach the fire to be able to cool it down by uh, by shooting water to the areas adjacent to it so that the fire will not spread on the surface of the building to the adjacent compartments uh, see how far the fire engine will have to be uh, it's literally on the other side of the uh, the internal perimeter access road it's on the public road trying to reach the fire from that distance on a low rise fire uh, with a very very deep building plan very often the fire will break out from the roof and the firemen will then attempt to cool down the fire by attacking the source but they cannot be immediately over the source because if they immediately over the source they'll be facing the full brunt of the radiant heat from the fire right so they have to go in sideways to again not to like attack the fire right in the right right at the heart of the fire but to cool down the surrounding areas to prevent the fire from yeah, spreading right so the um uh so see that that would be the intention huh? so again if you look at this distance over here now look at this picture very clearly here you can see that the the fire engine is parked what in what appears to be yeah it's, it's a pavement that can be used as an access way okay this is a pavement and there are car parking lines drawn here so from here we can deduce the width of this pavement uh say that is uh, five meters five meters plus five that's about 10 10 plus another two that's about 12 meters over here you see uh this this uh, turn table is parked diagonally uh it's being braced by its uh, its outrigging arms connected to the whole to the hydrant somewhere and it's fighting the fire in this way and uh from this edge to the building five five looks like there's another five or six meters to the face of the building I think that is the kind of physical areas that uh, the fireman actually needs to fight a safe fire. Uh, another illustration, we've got the face of the wall over here. Um, again, see how far these guys are have, have to park. You know, they really, really want to be as far away from the face of the building as they possibly could. Um, in a situation like I, I don't know where this picture is taken. Uh, I think it's probably in the Middle Eastern company or probably in Turkey or somewhere um, where we have a tall building here. This building will probably be close to re reaching the uh, requirement of an uh, island access in Malaysia. But in this case, it's not uh, because they've got buildings attached to the side of on both sides. Uh, the fire is leaping out at the top already definitely the firemen would have gone into the building via the firefighting shafts uh, to go to the floor below and try to contain the fire from spreading uh, they can't do much from the to the floors above already on the outside what they are doing is uh, they're using all these sky rigs to again to cool down to attempt to cool down the the surfaces of the units or of the adjacent floors to prevent the fire from spreading but you see Without the perimeter access, they can't reach this part. Right here, you can see a lot of steam, white steam, 
that means the uh, the fire the 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 water that they spraying in there is already working in cooling down the surfaces of the adjacent compartments, right? But there's no way they could reach this part here. So the fire will keep burning and the flames will keep leaping out. And yeah, after a certain time, the flame will leap back into the in, in, into the floors above. Good. So now let's talk about fire, designing for fire safety from the inside then. Right? We've seen what's happening on the side. So again, the same diagram. We've gone through all of this. And the, the key element then here is that that would be regarded as the outside elements. And those will be the inside elements, right? So what is on the outside? We've got the external water source, i.e. your hydrants. You've got the excess ways. You've got the near edge. And you've got the breaching inlet. All this is on the outside, outside installations. And all of these have to be connected to the inside via the, uh, the, the internal systems, the water tanks, the pumps, the gensets, the, you know, the emergency gensets, and the internal installations, the risers, the sprinklers, and to a lesser extent, the hose reels. So we've talked about access way, we have talked about access road. Now we've got this element here known as the access opening. So access opening, again, I'm taking off from the Singapore code now, the Singapore fire code. Uh, in Malaysia, we don't have, we, we don't have this, we don't have a particular specific description of what an access opening is or what it ought to be. All it just says access opening, all right? But in the Singapore uh, SDC code, uh, they do have a very clear definition of what's the requirement of an access opening. Essentially, it is an opening on an external wall for external firefighting and rescue operation. It has to be easily open from the inside and from the outside. Uh, not, not very good for, uh, for purposes of uh, theft prevention, uh, because it has to be easily open from the inside and from the outside, or fitted with a breakable glass. In this case, it's uh, tempered glass. Uh. It has to be unobstructed at all times. Uh, opening is to be marked with the red or orange triangle and etc cetera, etc cetera. and it specifies the minimum size minimum size of 850 by one meter uh, this is not the minimum size of a doorway right uh, essentially it is a minimum size of a hatch anything as long as the fireman is able to get into the building safely yeah and uh, the requirements of the provision or the distribution of access openings according to the Singapore code is that uh, you don't need it in any floor above 60 meters high anything more than 60 meters they don't bother giving us an opening we're not going to be able to get in there anyway <laughs> they can't reach it anyway and um, on uh, all the levels below 60 meters high they are to be spaced not more than 20 meters apart which means that uh, for every part of the exterior of the building below 60 meters, you will need access openings and the access openings are to be spaced and the access openings are to be spaced um, 20, not more than 20 meters apart. Yeah? So that means the idea is that you do provide access openings into the building at very, very regular intervals. Uh, this one would definitely be workable for um, say an apartment building or uh, an office suite building or buildings with uh, numerous compartments because this will then be corresponding to the access into the individual compartments. Huh? Um, in a situation of a large office floor area, it will also be workable because presumably then you would have, um, you would be able to have a perimeter frontage of all the officers via windows or via an external wall right in some more critical installation say um, uh, a clean room factory and all that a flatted factory and all this may be a little bit more difficult to 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 implement right but anyway those are the rules um, it is for us to then design our buildings accordingly uh, these are examples of the singapore application of the singapore fire uh, fire access openings right this one i think is an office building so you can see all the windows here they do have the panel 
specifically demarcated for that purpose with a triangle over there. Yeah, and this panel is either openable or if it doesn't seem to be openable, then it's breakable. That means uh, it's tempered glass and the fireman will be able to use that special tool to be able to immediately break the glass for entry. It can also be blank panels like this configured in a frame that can be open. Right? This one is a hinge frame or a drop down frame on a teeter. So, yeah, you can do that. Uh, this, this guy over here is enjoying his tea at a very, very high level. Now, if you look at that, it's, he's probably about the fifth, on the 15th floor of, of, of this building. And uh, yes, he's sitting adjacent to a fire access panel. Right? So yeah, you can break this glass to jump out or the fireman can break this glass to be able to uh, enter the building or to shoot water into the building. Right, so back to the same diagram that we used. We've gone through all the installations required, and particularly firefighting from the uh, fighting fire from the inside will require then the access opening. Right, the access opening over here for it to then be able to connect it to the firefighting shaft. So the fireman must be able to be able to come to this place, park their appliances uh, in the appropriate positions for them to do the staging of the firefighting operations, and for them to be able to get to be able to connect all the hoses to the hydrants, to the fire engines, to the breaching inlets, and to be able to connect it if they intend to fight the fire from the outside, to be able to connect all the hoses, they're all within reach and for them to be able to identify where's the access opening into the building to be able to bring them to the firefighting shafts firefighting access lobbies the fireman's lift the firefighting staircase and the rises yeah, to allow them to to be able to facilitate them to fight the fire from the inside that would be the most important element All right so firefighting shafts what are the what are the the bylaws, the minimum bylaw prescriptions on when do you actually need firefighting shafts. This will be a cross-sectional area. Uh, it's not exactly drawn to scale, right? but okay, you get the idea. Huh? Uh, this will be the cross-sectional area of a floor or of the ground level. I'll call that the fire appliance access level, ground level. 80 meters high and 9 meters below the ground level. So a building that is taller than 18 meters, it would require a firefighting shaft. Right? And the fire appliance access level is, yeah, it, it, it is for the access of a fire appliance uh, with, with, with the sky lift to be able to reach up to the building. So anything above 18 meters, you require a firefighting shaft. Uh, if you have a building that it's got a basement, but the basement is not more than nine meters below the fire appliance access level. So it requires a firefighting shaft uh, from the access level to the top of the building, right? But you do not need a firefighting shaft. The firefighting shaft need not be extended down into the basement. But however, of course, for purposes of access, and a safe egress from the basement, you will need a protected stair. So you will need a, you will need a protected shaft for purposes of access, fireman's access, and for the purposes of uh, uh, evacuation, right? But that protected shaft need not be a firefighting shaft. In other words, it need not necessarily have the risers to go down there and a fireman's lift to access it if it's less than nine meters. If for whatever reason you have a building that has got uh, basement levels uh, deeper than nine meters, but you, the, the building above ground is less than 80 meters, technically you would not need a firefighting shaft to serve the building above, but you will need a firefighting shaft to serve the basement below. Right? But 
really, you know, if you actually come up with a building of this configuration, you wouldn't exactly be so, how shall I say, you wouldn't exactly be so stingy, would you, right, to, to uh, not build a firefighting shaft all the way through, right? You're already going to put in the money for the, uh, for the risers and all that to go down to the basement. Surely it doesn't cost you too much. It's not much more effort for you to extend the firefighting shaft all the way to the top, even though it's not required by the bylaw. And of course, if you have a building taller than 80 meters and with the basement lower than nine meters, you will need firefighting shafts to be connected all the way through. Now, one caveat is that this particular shaft, uh, these shafts cannot be the same single shaft. You do have to split the shaft operating the, uh, for the shaft to access into the basement, physically separated from the shaft above. When I say separated here in this sense, I'm not talking about the uh, separation in terms of the, uh, the, the planning. I'm talking about the physical separation in terms of compartmentation. All right. In other words, uh, uh, for, for purposes of good design, the firemen, when they arrive here, it should be in the it, it should be in the lobby at the same level where the firemen would be able to access the the uh, the shaft to go up the building or the shaft to go down to the basement. Here, the separation is that it has to be fire separated. In other words, uh, if this shaft is incapacitated, it should in no way lead the fire to fire or smoke to spread and incapacitate the other shaft, right? So this separation is by means of compartmentation and, uh, and smoke control, right? So it comes down to the planning. Uh, if you have a building on a split level or a building where you only have access on the fire appliance access on one direction and you don't have a fire appliance access on the other direction, the same thing will apply. Right, you will still require, uh, find a way somehow to get the required perimeter access required for the building and to ensure that from the appliance access, the fireman is able to get into the uh, firefighting, to have access into the firefighting shaft. If you need an island site on a split level configuration, that is what you will have to do. You will still need a shaft uh, in this case, you'll have fire appliance access level from two levels. So the same thing would apply the access into the shaft from that upper level and also the access into the shaft from that lower level, fire appliance access level. All right, okay, firefighting shafts in terms of location, rises, Etc. Okay, this one is about the um, the location of the uh, the firefighting shafts and the and the various components. Uh, how many shafts do you need in a particular floor, and where do you put these shafts in a particular floor? Okay, the UBBL read in conjunction with the Malaysian standards one one eight three. Right, this is the Malaysian standards. Right, uh, you have to read it all in conjunction one from another. Uh, the prescriptions here are not contradictory, uh, rather they are for uh, uh, the, the Malaysian standards give you a more precise check for you to determine if the locations that you have allocated uh, via the prescriptions of the UBBL is sufficient or not. Okay, so always, always do read all these, um, um, uh, both the UBBL and the Malaysian standards uh, together. For, we, for us to understand it. In the, uh, the UBBL 230 and 231, in the prescription of the risers and uh, the location of the firefighting access lobby, it says that all parts of the floor must be within 45 meters from the landing valve. This is uh, measured from the landing valve itself. And uh, the firefighting access lobby, uh, level distance from furthermost point does not exceed 45 meters to the to the, uh, the door or to the, uh, the, yeah, it would be to the door of the firefighting access lobby from the floor in, 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 in question. 
right? And then uh, the UBBL on the fire lift, it also mentions that a fire lift shall not be located more than 61 meters of travel distance from the furthermost point. See, this travel distance here is different from this level distance. Level distance is about a radial distance, a direct distance, whereas travel distance is the physical distance that you will have to take to inspire the corridors through the compartments, between the partitions and things like that. Right? And in Malaysian standards, it says in totality a firefighting shaft, which incorporates the fire lift, firefighting access lobby and the risers as a firefighting shaft. And it says a firefighting shaft shall not be located more than 61 meters from the fire mains outlet, which means the landing valve. Okay, Fire mains outlet is the landing valve measured on the route laying a hose. In other words, this would be the distance in which you will have to maneuver and go around corridors and enter doors and all that. And if the firefighting shaft is without a fire lift, you say, hey, hang on a sec. I thought all firefighting lobbies are supposed to have a fire lift. Why is it that in Malaysian standards, it mentions that there's a, there are actually firefighting shafts without a fire lift? Okay, I'll get to that in a short moment. In a firefighting shaft without a fire lift, then the firefighting shaft must be so located that uh, not more than 45 meters from the landing valve. Right? There'll be no uh, point in the floor which is more than 45 meters from a landing valve. Okay, so the way we do it is this. We'll first start with the location of your risers and firefighting access lobbies. Huh? Now, this one here refers to radial distance. In other words, a direct straight line distance. This description here is on the route distance. In other words, the actual route in which you would take if you're carrying a hose, the nozzle of a hose, and you've got it connected to the landing valve, and you have to start then pulling the hose to where you want to go, right? that would be the route distance. We'll start with the... Um, we will start with, uh, say, a typical floor plate of a small office floor. So you have a fire lift over here. We have a wet riser located over here, and then we've got a protected secondary stair over there. So let's measure, let's do the measurements. Um, firefighting access lobbies. So from the door, level distance does not exceed 45 meters. So in this example, it seems to comply. Um, then we check the one for the for the from the landing valve on the hose. Mm, okay, all parts of the floor within 45. Okay, this part here doesn't comply, right? So, of course, the easy way to comply is very simple. Why put the landing valve over there? Why put the riser over there? If you, with this check, you'll find that you just got this area that cannot comply. All you have to do is just move the landing valve over to this side. Then it will definitely comply, right? But for the purposes of this illustration, let's just say that it is this situation, right? The landing valve is there, while the firefighting access lobby position complies, but the landing valve itself doesn't comply, okay? For the purposes of this example, let's just use this as a basis. Now, so the next way to check is you use a flow chart. So you start from here with your current design, ask yourself the question, is the fire lift within 61 meters uh, on the route of travel? If you say yes, you go on, but if you say no, then you have to add a firefighting access lobby. Right? So you add another fire access lobby. Right? But okay, in our example, is the fire lift within 61 meters? In the example that I showed, uh, in the example that I showed here, oops, how do I go back? Okay, in the example I showed here, is the fire lift within 61 meters of travel distance? Yes, it does. Yes, it is. Okay, so our example would be yes. So now, is the fire mains within 61 meters? Okay, just now we checked uh, by radial distance, it is not. Radial distance is 45 meters. Okay, now let's just say that, uh, let's just assume that that example doesn't comply with this either. Uh, that means when we put up all the office partitions, when we put up all the internal uh, compartmentation on the floor, we can't get the hose from the fire mains 
to the end of the to the end of the floor uh, is exceeding 61 meters okay let's assume that that is the case so what do you do you will have to install the fire mains in the secondary protected stair right and this is then where the firefighting shaft without a fire lift comes in All right so that is allowed only for the purposes of compliance with the location of your fire mains that means you have a firefighting access lobby the primary firefighting access lobby with the fire lifts and the risers comply in terms of its position but it's just that because of the location of the fire mains for a particular reason you can't reach to all parts of the floor you will then be allowed to install a secondary riser in a protected stair uh, which hasn't got a fireman's lift so if you do that and if you comply with all of these requirements you're done right your building is designed and it complies with all the required standards of the location of a fire fighting shaft okay. this is the way it works uh, this is the way a fireman would uh, this is how a fireman would this is how a fire this is generally how a fireman will approach a fire in a high rise they don't always go straight up to the floor on fire you know they'll always go to the floor below the fire uh, that that floor below the fire is called in firefighting terminology it's called the bridge head right the fire level is the floor that's on fire what the firemen do is that they either climb up the stairs but of course you give them a fireman's lift right that's the whole purpose they will take the fireman's lift right then from the fireman's lift they will climb up the stairs to the floor above for them to access the situation and to do all the staging and the setting up and all that lah, yeah, for them to to be able to fight the fire all right so this is where it is important that um, the now we see the importance of the fire fighting stair the fire fighting stair is to be fully protected and compartmented right and of course don't forget the firefighting access lobby must also be a protected lobby right to be separated from the uh, from the effects of the fire and the risers will then have to be is definitely you know, the risers are to be installed within the firefighting access lobby right on the um, on the floor plate now this is with reference to Malaysian standards uh, 1183 in terms of the relationship between the hydrants the access way the near edge of the access way breaching inlets and the access into the building So that would be outside the building on the right hand side would be the inside of the building so maximum distance uh, nearest hydrant to the breaching inlet maximum distance no more than 30 meters huh? uh, this one is quite uh, bomba do take this very very seriously i have situations where um, well we've designed all of this we've um, marked the hydrants and uh, we got our breaching inlets located I did have one situation in one of my projects where we did went to the maximum 30 meters. Why? Because of the configuration of the layout and planning, that was the nearest we could get it. So it was on plan, it was exactly 30 meters on plan, the way we've designed it and the way we dimension it. But of course, we all know our contractors, um, the the, the dimensional tolerances, especially for external infrastructural fittings, you'll be lucky if they can get it within one meter of where you have located it. So in this particular installation, this particular project, when Bomba came for the inspection, they actually measured. We were 31 meters away from the hydrant coupling to the breaching inlet coupling. 
we were 31 meters. The contractor made an error of one meter in the installation of the hydrant. Right? They pulled a hose and we are missing one meter. The hose cannot be coupled. So the only way for us to address the situation is to actually dig up the entire hydrant again and to relay it closer. Right? So when we relayed it, we relayed it to 29 meters. Right? So that's a lesson learned that uh, when it comes to maximum dimensions that are so critical, never ever specify down to the last millimeter. Always give yourself tolerance, okay? Because the contractors give themselves a lot of tolerance in their dimensions, especially for external works, infrastructure, all right? So that's a lesson learned, all right? Uh, now, so in this situation, if you have an accommodation uh, which doesn't carry any internal firefighting, um, um, uh, any internal, no, no risers, no, um, uh, no firefighting shaft, for example, right? The way to configure it is that um, the nearest hydrant to the breaching inlet shall not be more than 30 meters. And the, uh, the furthest point of the parking of the fire appliance access way shall not be more than 18 meters of the breaching inlet. In other words, the fire appliance access way should not be hindered from getting uh, closer than 18 meters to the breaching inlet. Right? That means the fire engine must be able to get closer to the breaching inlet. Right? If you design your uh, access way, say the access way stops over here, and that is more than 80 meters to the breaching inlet, it doesn't work, right? It means that the, the pavement of the access way cannot be more than 18 meters for the bomb, for the fire appliance access, uh, for the fire appliance to be parked to the breaching inlet. Where you have an internal firefighting shaft, which means that you'll have the wet risers and the firefighting access lobby. Uh, you will have the protected lobby or the corridor leading to the fire fighting access lobby. Uh, of course, then you'll have the access opening. So the same thing will then apply. The access way will be where the uh, fire engine can park wherever the firemen choose to. And the distance, the closest distance that the fire engine can get relative to the location of the wet riser shall not be more than 45 meters. So it's maximum 45 meters. Right? You must design the access way and the location of the wet riser to allow the fire engine to get closer, as close as possible to the wet riser. Right? But in any case, the nearest location shall not be more than 45 meters. Right, uh, uh, access openings without a fire mains. If you have uh, if an opening without a fire mains, so when the fire engine arrives, uh, again maximum thirty meters to the to to any position that the fire uh, engine can park, and maximum eighteen meters to the access opening, and from the access opening to the furthermost point of that floor of the ground floor shall not be more than 40 meters in a direct or a radial distance. So that would be the relationship. Huh? So if we are to draw all of this, say, in a very, very linear line, what it says is that there shall be from hydrant to access way, which means the location of the fire engine, to access opening, to the maximum uh, furthermost point of that floor, you cannot be more than 30 plus 18 plus 40. So it cannot be more than 88 meters, right? If you are to lay this out in a straight line. Uh, but of course, again, these are just standards in terms of how you actually design it. Again, again, I say, please do not use these as absolute dimensions. These are 
actually maximum dimensions. So do design it to, uh, to, to have these dimensions as minimum as you possibly could, right? In the example that I've shown you earlier. And from the excess opening uh, via uh, an actual travel distance to the furthermost point, uh, that means through the corridors, through the compartments, through the fire doors and all that, it shall be a maximum of 60 meters by route distance. Right, so this will probably be the equivalent of the, uh, the two thirds travel distance and this is the actual direct travel distance. Right, so this one, this relationship via Malaysian standards 1183 will then give you, will then prescribe the expected standards on where you allocate access openings, where you allocate the access ways, how you configure the minimum edge, the near edge, 2 meters to 10 meters, how you configure that, where you locate the hydrants, and the relationship between the hydrants, the access way, the access opening, and the, conf the interior configuration of your building. Okay, so in closing, let's look at this diagram again. Minimum 2 meter edge. Minimum 6 meter access way. So are we still designing only to minimum prescriptions? Right, I'll leave you guys with that thought and I hope that um, what I presented today will give you greater clarity into the prescriptions of the UBBL and the applications of the Malaysian standards. Right, uh, Zawa, I'll hand it back to you then. Thank you. Thank you, Li Xiong, for a very informative and interesting talk. Now let's go to look at the questions. Um, okay, the first one, for the building volume, the height is, uh, do we calculate the height to the very last floor or the roof height? Let's say the roof is 60 degree pitch. Do we take into the consideration of the roof volume? Okay, um, I, I will answer that. Right, when, we, when references to building height, uh, there are two references. Uh, do not confuse the two. One is the measurement of the overall building height for the purposes of measuring building volume, for the purposes of uh, the prescriptions in the 10th schedule and all the prescriptions in the schedule. When it says building height, uh, we references to compartment volume, compartment limits of fire rating, etc., etc. They're referring to your building height, which is measured to the overall building height. And the methods of measuring overall building height with regards to pitch roof or flat roof or mansard roof and all that is described in the red book. If you go to the red book, there are the diagrams, our red, not the red, the, the, the red book, uh, the guide to fire protection in Malaysia, um, that, that kind of old publication now, but hey, it's still relevant. Uh. We did that 20 years ago, so it's still relevant today. <laughs> we are updating it, all right? But the methods of measurement is in the red book. Right. So that one is for the purposes of uh, defining building volumes for the purposes of uh, the fire appliance access way. Uh, it's for defining um, the prescriptions in the 10th schedule, 9th schedule, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right, in terms of building volume and building height. The other measurement is particularly for firefighting shafts, applications of the risers, firefighting lifts, pressurization of protected shafts, etc. That one is the prescription of the topmost occupied floor. The 18 meters, the 30 meters, and the 45 meters. That is reference to the topmost occupied floor. That is not building height. Right, so there will be these two references. Huh? So uh, yeah, just, um, just don't mix them up. Lah. So, so uh, meaning to say the topmost uh, floor, we are looking at the floor slab, am I right? The topmost habitable floor, that means the topmost occupied floor, excluding a small mezzanine in your penthouse. Okay. 
The next one, uh, is there a reason uh, not to allow overhead protrusion from the perimeter of the building, even though after the 4.5 meter headroom clearance? Mm. Uh, yes, there is. The 4.5 meter uh, clearance is allowed for access roads. If you're driving an access road, you're entering the compound of your island site building, for example, you would probably be going past the guard house and a very nice archway to welcome you to welcome you into the building. Yeah, you're allowed 4.5 meters. Uh, fire engines can go under 4.5 meters because fire engines drive on the public roads and public roads also they have to go under below 4.5 meters or overhead bridges and all that. Uh, but when it comes to access way, access way is, as you can see from the photographs, firemen requires the airspace above the access way for them to pull up their turntable ladders, for them to position their, yeah, you know, all, all the overhead booms and all that for the purposes of firefighting. Lah. So if you have a bridge in an unfortunate location, the firemen can't use the access way. Then the access way becomes not useful. Like it no longer serves an access way. It's a bit like designing a car park structure. You demarcated all the car parking bays over there. And then at your car parking bay, you've got a big air conduct, which is at only one meters above the floor. You, know? you, can't, park a, you can't park a car there. Uh, you have demarcated the car parking bay, but it's physically too low for you to park a car in there. So it makes it useless. So it's the same principle as an access way. Yeah. You would be allowed uh, certain pipe bridges or certain things across, right? That one is a matter of discussion. You have to know exactly what you're doing. If you really need that, you have to configure your access ways, configure your hydrants, configure the access openings in a position such that that particular overhead bridge or that particular uh, uh, overhead structure that you have to go across the access way will not in any way interfere with the intended operations of the fire engine. You know? So in, uh, in basic principle as a law is that you cannot have any overhead obstructions in the access way. But we are all architects, we love to do things and there will always be situations where you do require something to go across an access way. So in situations like that, be prepared, do all your studies in accordance to Malaysian standards 1183, like the, all, all, the, all the things that I mentioned just now, and then go to Bombay and be prepared to discuss with them and to analyze the situation with them. To convince them that, look, you know, really, you know, for you, you know, my this bridge going over here is of no problem for you, ma. <laughs> you know, things like that, all right? Right, thanks. I think this one we need a clarification. Uh, for the six meter access way, uh, it, can we have drains within the six meter access way with a metal grill? Okay, the, okay, uh, can I emphasize this again? Uh? It is not a six meter access way. Uh. There's no such thing as a six meter access way, okay? Minimum, six minimum six dimension six meters. Uh, you design an access way to whatever requirement you need. It is not access way. An access way is not six meters wide, right? It is minimum. Okay, and the other criteria is that the access way is to accommodate the fire engine. It's to accommodate the passage of the fire engine, the maneuvering of the fire engine, the running up and down of the fire engine, you know, the fireman doing a wheelie on the, on the, on the access way and all that. So therefore, the surface of which the uh, the surface of which you demarcate as an access way will have to be able to withstand uh, thirty tons. Right? There's nothing to stop you from that. There's nothing to prescribe what should be the actual surface of the access way. There's nothing to prescribe that. All it says is that it has to be an access way and it has to be thirty tons. You have to withstand the weight of 30 tons. Huh? Obviously, it has to be suitable for vehicular access. Huh? Right? We have access ways that are on grass creek. We have access ways that are over metal gratings. 
with drain sums below. We have done excess waste over very nice paved concrete, which are meant for pedestrians. We have done all of that. The key, and key element is that it must be demarcated an excess way. When Bomba arrives, they have to recognize that they are allowed to drive over that and they can use that in an excess way. And that, that is a key element. Mm. I think that is quite clear. Uh, I picked up one from Facebook. Uh, someone is asking about the how do we determine the appliances uh, access perimeter length? Let's say if the building is not a simple square, there are small nooks and corners on the perimeter. Do we calculate the perimeter length? Okay, that, that is uh, really, really going down into, how shall I say, um, going down into the nitty gritty, which may not necessarily be, uh, be, be, be taken into consideration. The purpose of the access way is the frontage. The principle of it is the frontage. And the frontage is a frontage to the access opening. Right. The prescribed length, as I've shown in the example, is for the purposes of ensuring that your basic design, when you start with planning the building at the planning stage before you even get to designing the building, you have already taken into consideration how much surface area you require to provide to Bomba. Right. So it is not ever going to be calculated down to the last millimeter or down to the last dollar and cent. You're not going to argue that um, you know, my building has got the box up for a down pipe. So the box up for a down pipe adds another three meters to the perimeter of my building. So should I provide another one meter for the perimeter fire appliance access way? The answer is, if you're actually designing down to that level of measurement, I think you may have got the concept wrong in the first place. Right? It is not intended for that. Again, these are not intent, you're not supposed to design to the minimum dimension. Uh, so look at the overall picture. Start from there, start from designing it for the purposes of what it's for. Okay, uh, there's some uh, direct questions posted. Uh, for the new UBBL, will they consider uh, incorporating the example from Singapore, like the floor plate uh, for perimeter access and also on the, on the access panel? No. So, so we are still maintaining the prescriptive one from Malaysia, right? The Singapore one is also prescriptive. Uh, uh, the, the, the SDC uh, 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 the codes are prescriptive. It's just that they prescribed it on the basis. Lah. So in the Malaysian one, no, we, we are still not turning that into a, uh, we are still not turning that into a law yet, right? But as from the example that I've shown you, applying that does not in any way contradict the current law. Mm. Right. So the key word is this, we don't design just to comply with the law. We have to design for it to function. And we are talking about fire safety today. So we have to design for it to really, really allow the building to be a safe building. Right. The references to all that is to give you illustrations. So if you are aware of something, you know it can be done better then you do it, you know. Uh, doing things better does not in any way contradict the UBBL. The UBBL prescriptions are absolute bare minimum. And I've already shown you examples of how complying with the minimum prescriptions, you may get away by arguing that you've actually complied with the UBBL down to the last inch, as we're talking about just now, but it doesn't work. You know? <laughs> so if you are the guy signing your signature on the plan declaring that it works oh okay yeah you it's not going to work all right it's not going to work understood uh there's one question from hui fang uh, can we consider lake water or sea water to be the one of the source water source to fight the fire 
mm. in the yes. event that there is no hydrant. Yes, yes, that's correct. That's correct. Of course, the uh, the the law, the basic law is that we you build a building, you're supposed to get mains water la, and the mains water you have to have hydrant. La. But if the hydrant pressure is insufficient, you may end up having a pressurized hydrant. Uh, uh, that that is the the, the the basis of the designer. But yeah, in a situation where you have no access to mains water, definitely. Right, like in some some places in uh, in Cyber Jaya, on some places in uh, Sepang and all that, uh, uh, on the fringe of uh, Pritra Jaya and Cyber Jaya and all that, uh, quite a few of the resorts actually rely on the lake water as their backup uh, as the backup reservoir for fire safety. Yeah. But those would be really really unique situations, right? I really couldn't think of a situation whereby if you're designing a building in our urban area and you decide to tell Bomba, you know, I, uh, I can't get a hydrant. I don't want to install a hydrant here, but I see that there's a detention pond from my neighbor, on-site detention pond. Uh, I'm going to, can I use the on-site detention pond as my source of water? Bomba will throw you out, uh, you know. <laughs> so, so again, I'm talking about, uh, you no. Know, don't go for the minimum compliance, right? I'll always, always look at the situation and um, and uh, do what is practical and do what is reasonable. And for for lake, should we also look into consideration in the event it's a dry season yeah. that the lake will be dry Pre up? Precisely, you know, pre precisely, you, know, you may have to prove that, you know, how, what's the minimum water level on the lake at all times, right? So so you have, you have to compensate with additional rainwater harvesting and all these things on dedicated tanks. So you don't mix the rainwater the rainwater harvesting water with your gardening water, for example. You know, you, you, you just have to have this consideration. Uh, if you have a situation that gives you this opportunity to look at things in this manner, then yeah, please do a thorough job. Lah. Okay. Um, can can the two meter to ten meter near edge have different finish floor level from the access way? I think you mentioned about the curb, but is there like a max level difference? No, no. There, there there's no prescription on that. Um, for all intents and purposes, it can be the same level. You just demarcate it with a line or with some cat's eyes or something. Yeah. Uh, it is for purposes of measurement, so that uh, if, if, if you have defined the access way already, fireman doesn't want to... Okay, what, what it does here is this. They don't want you to measure your appliance access way. I mean, all of you are already going for minimum. Huh? Everyone, every time anyone says access way, they say six meter access way. Okay, 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 say you're going for six meter access way. They don't want you to measure your six meter from the edge of the... from exactly the face of the wall. Right, so you got a wall here, you got a wall here, and you say, yeah, in between are exactly six meters. Right, you cannot do that. Yes. So if we allow the two meter to be part of the apron or wall, yeah, you can. Uh, the level of the apron is there a limit to that? Like maybe one meter above or? Uh, no, no. Uh, it's whatever is practical, uh. Yeah, you have to be practical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it, it 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 doesn't define it down to that level. All right. Uh, Stuart so, so asking in the UBBL 249, uh, there's a, something mentioned to provide smoke venting for safe use of exit for windowless building. Is this considered the fire access panel? Uh, so, sorry, smoke venting for? Uh, smoke venting for safe use of exit for windowless building. That's in the bylaw 249. Yeah, that is for purposes of smoke control. So it's not considered as the fire access panel? No. No, that oh, one is smoke control. Right. I... That one, uh, that I don't think the clause is in 2012 anymore because uh, smoke control is really now all referred to uh, to MS1 uh, uh, 1780. Okay. 
Oh, I think now uh, it's time to end this this webinar. Uh, before we leave, I would like to express our gratitude to uh, Architect Chong and our sponsor for to make this webinar happen, and also not to forget our Northern Chapter Secretariats and the tech support from Garis XL. Uh, please remember to sign off. The sign off code is actually now displayed, and uh, please fill in the Google form. You can do so by scanning the QR code later and click the link from the chat box. Chat box. Okay, with that, we shall end this webinar. Thank you, everyone.